I'm delighted that the Cromwell Association is able to be here this morning um, to uh, support the Save the London campaign. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about the uh, excavations and the findings produced to date. The association both studies and commemorates the life and times of Oliver Cromwell. Um, Cromwell's one of the most divisive figures in our history, and one of whom nearly everybody has an opinion. Uh, whether you like him or loathe him, and I'm well aware quite a lot of people loathe him, he's a very difficult person to ignore in early modern, uh, early modern period. Now, as the chairman of the association, you might expect that I'm a historian, but as the chairman has already said, I'm not. Um, I was a museum curator and I looked after the collection of the Cromwell Museum uh, for a long time. But it's, as a curator, I'm particularly fascinated by the London because it's about the finds, it's about the objects. It's, to use a posh term, the material culture, or to put it more crudely, it's the stuff that I'm interested in. And the survival of everyday objects from the 17th century is not perhaps as common as one might, uh, one might expect or hope for. And what I aim to do over the next 20 minutes or so is to tell you about Cromwell's career, but I want to concentrate on the last years uh, when he was Lord Protector and to provide you with a context for when the London was built. Now, as far as we know, Cromwell never set foot um, on the London. But the link between him and the vessel is a very strong one. The ship was ordered, launched and commissioned under the Protectorate. And it was part of Cromwell's navy and it sailed under the flag of the Protectorate. But who was Cromwell? What do we know about him? And how did he end up as Lord Protector? Now, Cromwell has been described rather, rather inelegantly as the most biographied man in, in English history. And that's probably true. Um, but we actually know uh, quite a lot about the last two decades of his life, but we know very little about the first, about the first four. Cromwell was born in Huntingdon in 1599, and yes, he was a descendant of Thomas Cromwell, Henry VIII's chief minister, the subject of Hilary Mantel's uh, novels. His family were definitely gentry, um, he was the son of a second son, so he had no uh, he had relatively modest beginnings. He had no great house to live in, um, he had little to inherit. He was educated at Huntington Grammar School, the building that's now the Cromwell Museum, where coincidentally Pepys was also briefly a pupil, as was Edward Montague, um, Pepys' patron. It's quite extraordinary how many people were, you know, see three significant figures from the 17th century were educated in this actually really rather tiny <coughs> space. In 1616, he went to Sydney Sussex College in Cambridge. Um, he stayed there only a year. He went back to Huntington in 1617 when his father died. He went, went back to uh, look after his mother. We know he was married in 1620 to Elizabeth Dorshire. Um, he was, she was the daughter of a London merchant. And they returned to live in, in Huntington. He was elected MP for Huntingdon in 1628, but really, you know, he didn't really register on the national uh, scale at all. He did get into a dispute in the late 1620s in Huntingdon over the creation of a new borough charter, and he fell out with the leading authorities in Huntingdon. And somewhat in disgrace and financial difficulties, he sold up and he moved five miles down the road to St Ives where he hit what was probably socially the lowest point of his career. He rented land, and he was a small-scale farmer. This is a pre-Raphaelite painting by Paul Maddox Brown, showing Cromwell as the farmer of St Ives. At some point when he was in St Ives, he underwent some kind of religious conversion experience, the details of which we can only guess at. But religion is actually the key to understanding both Cromwell and the 17th century. The previous century had seen the Reformation initiated by Martin Luther sweep over the whole of, uh, of Northern Europe. And of course, the English church under Henry VIII broke with, broke with Rome. At times in England in the 16th century, you could be burnt at the stake for being a Catholic, 
and at times you could be burnt for being a Protestant. It was a hugely divisive issue. By the 1630s, though the tensions had diminished, there was still a real fear that Charles I, with a French Catholic wife, was going to take England back to a more Catholic style of worship. And this is a, a medal produced in, at the time of Charles I's marriage in 1625, showing him and Henrietta Maria. Now, Cromwell's own faith is actually quite difficult to pin down in terms of today's denominations. But it's clear that he believed in a providential God, that everything happened for a reason and by God's will. He also believed that individuals should be allowed to worship how they chose. But that is provided, of course, they weren't Catholic. <laughs> um, get that. Um, it's likely during uh, his time in St. Ives, Cromwell was worshipping in, in small illegal gatherings. And from that point on, he felt he was guided <coughs> in his actions by his God. In 1636, things looked a bit better for him when he inherited the role of tithe gatherer from his uncle in, in Ely. So he, the whole family moved on from St. Ives to Ely. Now, exactly how and why he became actively engaged in, in politics again, uh, we don't really know. But he was elected to Parliament, but this time for the borough of Cambridge rather than Huntingdon. And he was elected to Parliament both in the short and the long parliaments that first met in, in 1640. Um, and this was the first time Parliament had been called since the King had dismissed it 12 years earlier. Now, the relationship between the King and Parliament was strained to say the least. Charles believed that his right to rule was God-given, ruled by divine right. Parliament, of course, didn't accept that. Parliament wanted to exercise its own rights to raise taxation and to protect the Protestant church. And the relationship broke down entirely when the king tried to arrest five members of Parliament. It didn't, it didn't happen. The, the, the birds had flown, um, the, 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 the the MPs had gone, and the king had to leave London for his own safety. And in the aftermath of that developer, civil war became an uh, inevitable outcome. The civil war is generally believed that the date at the start of the civil war is, is, is always said to be the 22nd of August, 1642. But before that date, Cromwell had already shown himself to be a man of action. And as MP for Cambridge, he'd seized the ammunition stores at Cambridge Castle and he'd intercepted um, college plate that was leaving, uh, leaving uh, Cambridge um, to go to the King. So he, he, he'd effectively uh, committed highway robbery. Um, but by 1643, as the war started, he was already a colonel in the Army of the Eastern Association. And when the armies were reorganised um, into the new model army, he rose to the level of Lieutenant General of Horse, second in command to General Fairfax. Cromwell had managed to um, get round what was called the self-denying uh, ordinance. So Cromwell managed to stay both uh, in a military role and a political role. And the self-denying ordinance was supposed to stop that from happening. Now, without any previous military training or experience, he consistently demonstrated that on the battlefield he was a very skillful commander. And this is James Ward's painting of Marston Moor, which was 1644, and of course Cromwell was instrumental as well in May, at the Battle of Naseby the following year. By the end of the Civil War, the first Civil War, Cromwell was a national figure. But at that point, he wasn't in overall command of the army, and he certainly wasn't in overall control of Parliament. So when you see the Civil War represented as, as a conflict between Charles I on one side and Cromwell on the other, that is quite simply false. It's a later, it's a retrospective reading of how things happened. Now the Second Civil War in 1648 demonstrated to just about everybody on Parliament's side that the King was fundamentally untrustworthy. He wasn't capable of honest negotiation. Well, if you believe you were, you were ruling by divine right, you wouldn't have to believe in honest negotiation, would you? <laughs> um, but this position of the kings inevitably led to his trial, and perhaps less inevitably to the execution of the king at the end of January 1649. 
Now, the execution was neither long planned for nor anticipated. But to say it had consequences is perhaps an understatement. How should a nation be run without a monarch? It was just unprecedented. Parliament, known as the rump because many had been excluded prior to the king, prior to the, prior to the trial of the king, created a council of state as the executive body of Parliament. And Cromwell was briefly uh, the, the, the chairman of this new council of state. Excuse me, just must have some water. Now, without wanting to steal any thunder from any subsequent speakers, in the context of today's subject, the period between 1649 and 1653 is really very interesting, as it saw a significant expansion in the Navy. Although the naval contribution to the, uh, to the uh, Parliament's victory in the Civil War was secondary to that of the army on the land, the naval contribution shouldn't be underestimated. The Navy was the prime means of transporting supplies, arms, men and ammunition uh, around, the, around the nation, and particularly to strategic ports like, like Hull and Plymouth, and it supported the army in the capture of both Bristol and Newcastle. And if the Crown had been in control of the Navy, it would almost certainly have been used to blockade, uh, blockade London. London, of course, was holy of Parliament. And if London had been blockaded, it would have fallen, and the whole outcome of the Civil War would probably have been very different. Now, the Rump recognised the necessity of reinforcing the Navy. At the beginning of 1649, it only had 50 warships, which was insufficient to secure the coast against a potential Stuart invasion. <clears throat> if the Stuarts had been able to enlist the support of the French or the Spanish, you know, the fear was they would lead, a, lead an invasion. <clears throat> now, how, how realistic this threat was, you know, it, you know, it probably don't, don't really know, but it was probably overestimated, but it was a definite possibility it could have happened. So the Rump immediately started ordering new vessels and expanding the fleet. And by 1660, well over 200 new vessels had been added. There were also threats closer to home. In 1649, Scotland and Ireland were still separate nations, and they represented further bases from which England could be attacked. A strong navy also represented what we would now call, uh, particularly though it's a local government, although it was ex-local government, uh, we call income-generating opportunities. <laughs> um, because it gave the ability to uh, seize foreign vessels and their contents. And when Cromwell led Parliament's army to crush Irish resistance, a significant fleet was needed to transport it across the Irish Sea in August 1649. And that's the only time we know that Cromwell <coughs> actually left uh, the mainland of the British Isles. Uh, Cromwell's campaign in Ireland, 400 years old, is still hugely controversial and debated massively by historians as to what actually did and didn't take place. <coughs> The following year, Cromwell led an army into Scotland for the first time as overall commander, as Thomas Fairfax refused to attack north of the border. Now, again, the navy was crucial, both in, help, in, in, in acting as a, a route to get supplies to the army, and also by active engagement. I mean, the army, the, the navy bombarded Leith in late July 1650. And this was just two months before Cromwell's most extraordinary victory, his victory um, at Dunbar on the 3rd of September, 1650. 3rd of September is a date which you will hear mentioned one, one, one or two more times. The final act of the civil wars, or the wars of the three kingdoms, as they perhaps more accurately ought to be called, fell exactly one year later, on the 3rd of September, 1651, when Charles Stuart's Scottish army was defeated at the Battle of Worcester. <coughs> Cromwell marched his army back to London triumphant, and Charles I hid up an oak tree, therefore giving us lots of pubs called the Royal Oak. <laughs> anyway, for the first time, the three kingdoms were united under one Republican administration. And whilst this may be uh, interpreted as a bold claim by some, it's not unreasonable to assert that it was Cromwell's military prowess that led to that achievement. Now, Cromwell managed to maintain his dual role as both head of the army, mindful of the need to ensure that soldiers were always paid, or, or at least not too much in arrears, 
and his role as a politician. He was still an MP in the Rump Parliament and served on the Council of State. But the period between September 1651 and the spring of 1653 is slight in terms of our detailed knowledge of Cromwell's everyday activities. But the Rump was far from inactive, but it failed to meet Cromwell's expectations. Now, one of the most intriguing initiatives of the Rump was to pursue a possible union of the new Commonwealth with the united provinces of the Netherlands, which unite into one single commercial and diplomatic union. Now, at a theoretical level, this made sense, unifying the two major Protestant maritime powers of Northern Europe into one single economic bloc. And does it all sound strange? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the proposal was rejected by the Dutch, and within a short space of time, what appeared to be an amicable relationship broke down. The passing of the Navigation Act in the autumn of 1651 asserted that English trade and fishery should only be carried in English vessels, and foreign ships were banned from carrying trade from Asia, Africa, and America into English ports. Now, to the Dutch, this was an extreme provocation, which resulted in the First Anglo-Dutch War, a war fought at sea um, and the first major naval conflict in English history. This was an unnecessary war between two powers who had more in common than they had differences. And for Cromwell, the Rump was pursuing the wrong things, or, or at least it wasn't pursuing the right ones. Cromwell wants a purer, godlier society, and he was frustrated that the reforms he wanted, and ones that the radical army and radical elements of the army sought, weren't priorities for the run. Cromwell wanted to make reforms to the law. He wanted to make it equal for all and for the alleviation of poverty and social reform. He also just wanted to make men better. It's quite difficult to legislate to make men better. But his frustrations boiled over in April 1653 and the Rump was discussing a, a new bill to settle the constitution to provide for a new representative parliament. Cromwell and senior figures in the army wanted to see an appointed parliament of persons of honour and integrity, men well affected to religion and the interest of the nation. They thought they had an agreement with the Rump that further discussion should be put on hold, but the Rump carried on discussing things. And that was too much for Cromwell. And on the 20th of April, he summons, <coughs> he backed up by a troop of musketeers. He dismissed the rump and similarly ejected the rump's council of state. <coughs> now this was a coup d'etat. Power had been seized by force. But it, it was genuinely unusual for a coup d'etat, both then and now, inasmuch as Cromwell and the army weren't doing this for personal gain. They were doing it for the benefit of the nation. I know they all say that, but <laughs> probably he was doing it for God's purpose. Now, from that point on, until his death five years later, Cromwell was undoubtedly the dominant force in the new regime. The historian Ronald Hutton's assessment, and, and Ronald Hutton is, is no fan of Cromwell, is to say that he aimed at power would be horribly unjust but he did have a shrewd instinct for attainment. Just as after the execution of the king four years earlier, there was no clear plan as to what to do next. Now, if Cromwell had been plotting and scheming to achieve power, there surely would have been. But it was never Cromwell's way to attempt to govern on his own. The army council of officers determined there should be a new, much reduced council of state and a nominated rather than an elected senator. There were only 140 members, including for the first time representatives from Scotland and Ireland. And most of these people didn't come from what can be described as, as ruling families. The name by which this parliament is best known is the Barebones Parliament, drawn from the name of one of its members, Praise God Barebones, a London leather dealer and lay preacher, and all round a fun looking chap. <laughs> <laughs> the summons to those nominated came from Cromwell as Captain General and Commander-in-Chief of all the armies and forces. And it was raised, dated and sealed on the 6th of June. 
As became abundantly clear in his long and really rather rambling address to the new assembly on the 4th of July, Cromwell's belief in, in providence was paramount. He was absolutely committed to the actions he was taking. Now at the point he sealed the summons to the 140 members of the new assembly, his confidence that he was following the will of God must have been boosted by the news of the English victory at the Battle of the Gamma three days earlier. This was the first battle to involve the full fleets of both the Dutch and the English navies, a battle which saw heavy Dutch losses and no English ships lost. Uh, interestingly, before that, to the London that sank uh, on, on the, uh, the anniversary that we're marking today, the forerunner of that London um, was also involved in the Battle of the Gamma. It was a lot smaller ship than, uh, than, than the vessel we're concerned with today. But, and of course, they were fighting under the flag of, of the Commonwealth rather than the later flag of the Protectorate. I also have to ask is it entirely coincidental? that Admiral Blake, who was a, uh, a player at the, uh, at the Battle of the Gamma, is entirely <coughs> coincidental that he was also nominated as a member of the new assembly. But even though it was an appointed parliament, the Bare Bones Assembly, Cromwell at least, failed to deliver, and it was badly split between the moderates and the radicals. And by early December, it collapsed, with the majority voting to abdicate its powers. This time, matters were best prepared, and the Council of State passed a written constitution, our first written constitution, um, the instrument of government, and agreement was rapidly reached for Cromwell to be appointed as the first Lord Protector. And there was a small, rather low-key ceremony on Friday the 16th of December. And the instrument of government provided for triennial parliaments, with the first to be called the following September. There was to be a single chamber with 460 MPs representing all parts of the Commonwealth, and there was also a protectoral council. Now, it established a balance between Parliament, protectoral council, and the head of state, the Lord Protector. Cromwell could only govern through Parliament and the council, but until Parliament was due to meet in eight months' time, on the 3rd of September, 1654, the Protector and the Council were given temporary powers to enact legislation through ordinances and to raise taxation. And these temporary powers were well used. There were well over, there were over 80 ordinances passed in this period, becoming a range of public, private um, and uh, local issues. And it was also in this period that the Anglo-Dutch War was concluded by the Treaty of Westminster, that was signed in early April, and this led the structure to commemorate the conclusion of the Anglo-Dutch War. Now, the order for the building of the London was placed on the 3rd of July. I thought it would be interesting to look at what other business was passing over Cromwell's desk, or at least required Cromwell required Cromwell's approval around the same time. And in a way, it's a microcosm of the Protectorate's ambitions and activities. <coughs> On the 6th of June, an ordinance for raising an assessment, taxes to pay specifically for the army and navy. On the 13th, an ordinance for establishing a High Court of Justice. Two on the 23rd, one for encouraging the settlement in the newly conquered island, and one which sounds curiously modern, and one for the regulation of hackney coachmen. <laughs> regulating taxi men in London. Um, another one for raising an assessment, um, for raising taxes. And on the last day of the month, a further one for suppressing of drunkenness and profane cursing and swearing by the employees of the Commission of Customs. And on the day of the order of the London was placed, the day after the order of the London for the London was placed, an ordinance banning horse races for six months. And it was also during this period that the seeds, one of the greatest setbacks of the Protectorate and Cromwell personally was sown, when they planned for the great Western design. After the Treaty of Westminster was signed, there was a problem of what do you do with the Navy? You know, it stood down. Well, the answer was quite simple. You have another war. Um, and this time it was decided to pick one with Spain. But rather than fight it in European waters, they decided they would try and capture the Spanish island of Hispaniola. 
And they thought that if they captured Hispaniola, there would be enormous riches flowing from it, and they'd also be able to see Spanish treasure ships taking silver back to Spain. Also, more importantly, and the ultimate justification, it would help to defeat Catholicism. So what was not to like? <laughs> the fleet sailed in December 1654, but the whole operation was badly planned, badly provisioned, ill-equipped. You see the guys outside in their thick woolen jackets. Well, that's the kind of costume that people were sent to fight in the Caribbean. It was going to be a disaster. So when news came back that the Great West, that, the, that it had all been a failure, Cromwell was distraught, and he had to ask himself whether or not he was doing what God wanted him to do. Things um, <clears throat> from that point on, he'd already dismissed two protectoral parliaments, and Parliament was failing him um, on two fronts. Um, and Parliament was trying to create a new local militia, which would have undermined the role of the army. There had been uh, plots against Cromwell, there was an uprising against Cromwell, Cromwell tried the system of major generals, but even that didn't work, and the rule of the major generals was abandoned. Um, under the sexual, Second Protectoral Parliament. Under the Second Protectoral Parliament, there was a second revised constitution introduced, the Humble Petition and Advice. The Humble Petition, sorry, this is Cromwell looking at <laughs> <laughs> um, There was a second constitution, the Humble Petition and Advice, um, which created a new House of Lords, um, and it, the first draft also allowed for it was virtually the recreation of the monarchy with Cromwell if it accepted the title as King Oliver. But that would have been a step too far for him. It would have jeopardised his relationships with at least some of the army. The regime, though, did become increasingly monarchical, and the ceremony that confirmed Cromwell as Lord Protector was very similar to a coronation. Cromwell's protector lasted little more than a further 15 months. But we shouldn't overlook the achievements of the Commonwealth and Protectorate. The principle of a constitutional monarchy was established, albeit not confirmed until the Glorious Revolution 30 years later. The idea of freedom of worship had been broached, though lost again at the Restoration. The kingdoms of England, Scotland and Ireland had been united, and Jews were allowed to settle peacefully and live peacefully in this country for the first time since the 13th century. And although the Western design had been a failure, Jamaica was acquired as a result, which proved to be a long-term benefit. Britain had become a strong international power with a strong navy. And by the end of the 1650s, the world was recognisably a more modern one than the one Cromwell had been born into. It was a huge period of transition and change, and Cromwell was in no small part a catalyst for it. Cromwell died of natural causes in his bed at Westminster on the 3rd of September 1658. His funeral ceremony, including the use of a wooden effigy, was based on that used for James I, and he was buried in Westminster Abbey, although not ultimately allowed to rest in peace. His was an extraordinary life, where he served many different roles, called to several employments in his own words. He lived in extraordinary times, and a life worth studying and remembering. Thank you very much.